So good morning, everyone out there. I hope this uh, Tuesday morning finds you well. Um, we're really pleased to offer this informational session on the pandemic uh, as our kind of first uh, official Talk Tuesday of the year. We'll give folks uh, a chance to join here. Um, and then I'll introduce our, our guest speaker. So as usual, we will uh, we'll hear from Dr. Nosa and then uh, if you have any questions, um, you can populate the Q&A feature um, in Zoom and uh, we'll draw questions from there. Uh, we'll also uh, capture the transcript uh, so we can see uh, and make sure all the questions are addressed. So without further ado, we're really pleased to have Dr. Nosa here um, with us today. He's the medical director for International SOS, a company you may be familiar with, uh, has been with S International SOS for over a decade. And he's got a long history of working in the medical and health industry. Uh, he is a go-to person, uh, has spoken, has written with authority on all aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially how it's played out in Dubai. So he's here with us today to educate our community on the crisis. And as I mentioned, we'll take some questions at the end through the Q&A feature. Um, this is a session so that, um, you know, I think we, we did one for the faculty and staff on Sunday. While we heard things that we've been hearing and reading, it's good to, to validate the importance of those. But we also learned some new things and he's got some very interesting slides uh, to share with you. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Nosa. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, thank you everyone for having me. Um, I would um, just give a, a broad overview on um, the updates and coronavirus. And um, I know everybody is more or less an expert now when it comes to the information. And I hope I'll be able to give you something new today and make some sense uh, you know, out of uh, maybe the information you already have. Um, so we'll look at um, updates, we'll look at transmission rates, and then we'll look at the usefulness on, of um, the, all the measures, social distancing, use of masks that have been put in place. And afterwards, you know, I'll be open for, for questions. Um, and so we're talking about the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, and COVID-19 is the disease that the virus um, causes. And so um, I'll start with a, a world overview. Um, we are still very much in the middle of um, the um, pandemic. Um, you know, when you look at all the continents, all continents are trending um, upwards. Um, in fact, we have a prediction we normally carry out. And um, um, last week we predicted that, you know, by September 24th, um, the world um, cases would cross um, 32 million. And of course, we also predicted that um, it would cross 33 million at by September 27th, and we know that in, in a few days time, we're going to cross um, the 34 million uh, mark for the number of cases um, globally. And I think also important to note is that we've also crossed um, the 1 million mark for the number of deaths that um, the pandemic has caused. So we're still um, seeing ourselves around um, a 3% mortality rate. And I think um, very important to also uh, note in the UAE here, the mortality rate is um, about 0.5%, which is much less than you know, the global average. All right, so how do we look at this pandemic? Because I, I get a lot of questions with regards to are we in a second wave, are we in a third wave, are we still in the first wave? I think if you compare this pandemic to the previous flu pandemic, the pre uh, in the previous flu pandemic, we had very clear cut you know, waves in, in, in the sense that we had very high cases and then it reduced and then you had um, a real uptake of cases. We as an organization, we prefer to look at this um, pandemic as a cycle where any country or location can be in any one of um, any point on this cycle. So a location can be, you know, just uh, having limited activity. You could have increasing activity and then they go into what we call an outbreak. And then they start having a decreasing activity. So it depends on the cases, they can move from one point of the cycle um, to another point in, in the cycle. So is it truly a second wave? I guess that's the question we need to ask. Are we going through a second wave? Again, there are different ways you can look at a wave um, where you have um, um, high peaks and low valleys, you know, very high peaks. You know, people tend to say, okay, is that the first wave? Or you have what we call um, a slow burn 
where you know you're having peaks and valleys. And if you look at probably Dubai, we want to say we're not um, really looking at um, first or second waves. We're currently probably looking at you know a slow burn. You know where we're just having high peaks, low valleys. You know going um, quite um, steadily. Also, again, the cases in Dubai, we've crossed um, the 90,000. And I think it's important to make sense of the numbers. Um, you know, people get a bit worried when they see um, a lot of numbers being thrown out, you know, 1,000 cases today, 600 cases um, tomorrow. And one of the ways we try to make sense of the data, because if you follow the um, cases, you're going to have quite um, a jagged edge um, kind of um, graph. So we use what we call a five-day moving average, where we take an average of um, the five days cases every day, we look backwards an average of the five days. And if you look at the right hand um, quadrant um, um, graph there, you would see that uh, it's quite a nice slope. You know, it's quite a nice slope um, when you look at the five day moving average. Now, why do we do this? We, you need to um, factor in a number of things. For example, um, some cases may not be reported over weekend. In a certain day, you may have a high number of people reporting for testing the next day. So when you use um, a five-day moving average, it smoothies, smoothens out your, um, your graph, and then you have a better interpretation of, um, of what is going on. Another good way to interpret the results we are seeing in Dubai is to look at what we call the positivity rate. Now, the positivity rate of um, the test we are seeing or the cases can be calculated in two ways. Either we calculate the number of tests being done, so we divide the number of positive tests over as the, uh, uh, the numerator, and then the number of total tests done as the denominator, or we divide the number of people who have tested positive over the total number of people who have been tested. And I'm sure you are aware in Dubai that we get reports uh, by number of tests done. So we use the second method, which is number of positive tests over the total number of tests done. And when you look at this, you you now discover that actually the positivity rate in the cases we are seeing in Dubai is normally less than one. In one or two um, cases, it goes to about 1%. And this is pretty good because what this tells us is that they are doing quite a number of tests, right? And so they are capturing as many people as possible. And then the number of positive cases you are getting from so many tests being done is, is, um, is quite good. I mean, in some other um, locations, we're having positive um, rates of up to 40%, which means that they are probably not doing enough testing, right? So they are probably testing only those who are infected or only those who are showing symptoms. So when you do that, you have a, you know, a, a, a whopping, let me use the word, a whopping of your positive cases. So the more tests you do, and then you, you capture a, a much larger group of people, and then with a positive rate of less than 1%, it um, is quite good for what we're seeing here in Dubai. Now, our, another good point to talk about at this time would be our reproduction number. So what is the reproduction number? And this is why, you know, this would give us a good segue into why we, you know, uh, put in the measures that we've, um, uh, we advise people to take when it comes to preventing um, um, COVID-19. Now, the reproduction number has to do with the number of people an infected individual can, have, uh, can infect. All right. So um, for COVID-19 currently, uh, we think the reproduction number, um, some, study, some authorities will tell you three, some will say up to five, but that's a fairly um, average. So let's take three, for example, one infected person can infect three people. And this will make more sense when I go into the modes of, um, of transmission, right? So if you compare um, the reproduction number of COVID-19 to perhaps a disease like measles, which is a true airborne disease, the reproduction number of measles is about 15. So one person, with measles can actually infect up to 15 people. Now, so when measures are put in place, right, when you put in a, a good measures in place, you are able to reduce the reproduction number of um, COVID-19. Now, this graph is showing us how, you know, using 1,000 cases, you know, would increase under different in infection rates. So if the reproduction number was just 0 0.5, you can see the bottom graph, you know, you have, a less more people being infected over a longer period. And then if you have a high reproduction number, say even a reproduction number of 1.1, you have, you know, a thousand people can infect close to um, 25,000 people over a period of um, 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 60 days or two months. But how does this happen? Just look at this as an exponential graph. All right, so we have um, 
an individual reproduction number. The first um, individual we see on top of this graph is infected, no barriers at all. He infects three people. The three people without barriers go on to infect another three people, and then you have this exponential increase in the, in the spread of the disease. However, if that individual who is sick, temperature um, is um, high, and then he isolates himself, he cuts off, you know, infecting other people, and that reproduction number practically goes to zero. So, and then you have a third scenario where an individual is asymptomatic, but he uses the barrier uh, methods, and then he also brings that reproduction number almost to zero. So, in when you have a scenario like that, you see the possibility when we um, put in isolation, put in our barrier uh, uh, methods, we have we drastically reduce the reproduction number or the number of people who get infected um, with COVID-19. So how is COVID-19 spread? I know you, yeah, a lot of you would uh, are fully aware of this, but I just want to touch on one or two, um, one or two aspects. Now, we know that, um, or would I say that we know the main mode of transmission is by droplet spread. Now, what do we mean by droplet spread? Um, we mean that, now think about it, the COVID-19 virus itself is very, very tiny. We're talking of a diameter of about 0 0.1 microns. However, the COVID virus does not travel alone. It travels with proteins, it travels with liquids, it travels with a lot of materials, and that's why the diameter becomes quite big. So droplets are those diameters that it travels in that is more than 60 microns. So we're talking of about 120 times bigger than the diameter of the virus itself. So when it moves, you know, in, in uh, um, when it moves, you know, in droplets form. Now, droplets forms are those forms that, you know, when you cough, you know, those last droplets, they drop, you know, um, pretty close by, and then people get infected. Now, the other method of spread is um, the aerosol spread. Now, aerosol spread is any, an aerosol is any material that can be carried by air. All right, so how does the aerosol spread um, come about is, these are lesser diameters than 60 microns. So I'm saying lesser than 60 to 100 microns would be an aerosol spread. This is an extremely important route of spread, especially in enclosed spaces, in crowded um, um, spaces. So you have these aerosols suspended in air for longer periods. You know, the WHO initially came up and told us that, you know, in hospital settings where droplets can be aerosolized, you know, where we use um, uh, procedures that um, introduces oxygen, you know, it makes these droplets a lot smaller and it's easier for them to go a bit um, um, further. So we're seeing that that is also a very important um, um, spread. It's about 40% of, this, of, of the um, infections are being caused by aerosol spread, especially in crowded places. And so um, we need to be careful um, when we're in crowded places. That's why we advise that um, as much as possible, ventilate um, your environment. You know, if you're in your vehicles with other people where you can, you know, drive with um, the windows down, it's better to do so. Uh, environments need to be ventilated. And just a point on, on that, um, ACs are not really um, ventilators. You, when we talk about um, ventilation, it needs to be a system whereby air can be extracted from the um, environment and then new air introduced. Most of our ACs are um, heating and cooling uh, mechanisms. They really, many of them really do not ventilate, but some of them also have what you call the open ventilation mechanism. So if your AC is, is, is like that, it's always advisable, especially when you have uh, people in the same room to use that um, to increase the ventilation. And then the third um, way that we believe that um, COVID-19 is spread is through surface contact. All right, so contaminated um, surfaces. And we know that the virus can, uh, with studies that have been done, the virus can survive for uh, a number of hours up to uh, approximately about three days, depending on, on the surface. So again, you are looking, uh, like I said initially in aerosol, you are looking at um, in less than two hours in a poorly uh, ventilated room. So you have these particles um, suspended in the air in a poorly ventilated room. Then on cardboard and on, on cardboard and other organic surfaces, we are seeing that it can survive for uh, less than a day. And bronze and plastic materials, it can survive for up to one or two days. And then on highly polished um, surfaces like steel and metal surfaces, it can actually survive for up to 72 hours. And and this brings me to an important point when it comes to our cleaning or sterilization. Fumigation enough or just spraying a surface is 
usually not enough to um, kill the virus. The most important thing about disinfecting is that there needs to be a mechanical action. So, for example, when we tell people to wash their hands, we want a mechanical action, you know, proper uh, washing of your hands for um, not less than 20 seconds. And thankfully, we have a lot of um, the wristwatches with apps now helping us to count um, our times. And what I advise parents and teachers is that, you know, for your, for your children, you can tell them to um, sing the happy birthday song um, twice or they can sing, uh, you know, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, you know, if they sing it twice while they're washing their hands, that should take them ni nicely above them, um, um, 20 seconds. So very important, when we are cleaning, that there needs to be a mechanical action so that you can actually break through and, you know, uh, break the envelope that um, surrounds um, the virus. Okay, and I know now we are going to the flu seasons, and uh, the flu season, a lot of people are asking questions, should I take a vaccination or not? And we're advising that it's very important at this time to take a vaccination, you know, um, in, uh, because of the flu season. Number one, an individual can be infected by more than one virus. So, I mean, somebody who gets COVID-19 and flu, it's actually a double whammy. So we need to um, um, vaccinate ourselves. And also that will also help our healthcare system, you know, not to be overwhelmed. Having a combination of both COVID-19 and then you're having, you know, people with flu being um, admitted into the hospital. So. I, you know, um, decided to put this slide just to help us, you know, to look at some subtle differences between the common respiratory infections. Now, this slide doesn't mean that if an in individual, for example, does it, uh, is sneezing, means he's definitely not um, COVID-19. I've just put up this slide to, you know, help teachers and also help parents, you know, to have some form of comfort when you see certain uh, symptoms, not to always just think that it's COVID-19. So for example, um, I'll take a few of the symptoms. Fever, you know, um, is often associated with COVID-19, often associated with influenza, but is very rare when it comes to common cold. And with seasonal allergies, it's a plus or minus. You know, some people may have allergies without fever. Some people may have allergies with fever, All right? I think an import, another important one is um, cough. Um, cough is often associated with COVID-19 and it's usually dry. All right, this, this is also holds true for um, flu, influenza. And then um, for common cold, cough is usually mild and seasonal allergies, you can also have cough. So you can also see that once you have your influenza vaccine, it also helps to eliminate, eliminate some of the symptoms, right? So it protects you, makes you safer, and then you are sure that it's not flu, then it's probably something else. Um, a good one also is sneezing. We sneezing, we've not seen sneezing associated with COVID-19 or, or flu, but with cold and allergies, you know, it's, it's often, you know, I get people, you know, in the office, they call me and say, ah, doctor, you know, I'm sneezing, I'm having a runny nose, uh, what should I do? I said, well, those two symptoms, you know, at the back of my mind tells me very easily that it's probably not, it's probably not COVID-19 you're having, you know, you're having something else, so let's watch it for a few days. And usually in a few days, you know, they, they get over, you know, their symptoms. So again, um, an important one is also um, sore, um, um, sore throat. So for sore throat, you know, um, it's sometimes in COVID-19, sometimes in flu. In cold, it's, 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 it's quite often, but in seasonal allergies, we don't usually see sore throat, you know, in seasonal allergies. Diarrhea, especially for children, is, is important. COVID-19, you know, initially we, th we thought that, you know, um, diarrhea was an important symptom, but it's not. It's not, but for flu, of course, um, children can come up with um, diarrhea at times. And of course, it's not associated with cold or, or seasonal allergies. Difficulty in breathing is also um, an important one. And why it's important for COVID-19 also, it helps us to differentiate between a mild, a moderate, or a severely um, ill individual. Once an individual starts um, having some difficulty in breathing, he's already a moderate case and needs to go to the hospital and be seen by a healthcare professional. And last but not least is the loss of um, taste and smell, which is which we now see often in COVID-19. I've had to cancel quite a number of people who's lost their smell and taste. Um, in the other forms, it's, it's rare, but with common cold at times, you know, when these um, sinuses are um, congested, an individual may lose his smell. So usually we give them some decongestants to clear that and usually it will go. But with COVID-19, it's not a congested smell. It's something, it's more um, sensory or more neural effect with the loss of the, of the um, um, taste and smell. So that's just a snapshot just to help us, you know, when we are, um, 
you know, attending to our wards just to give us a, a bit of comfort that this may not be COVID-19, maybe something else so that, uh, you know, our stress levels will be a lot less. All right, so in terms of testing, um, for the COVID-19, um, I've been asked this question uh, on a number of occasions, you know, when is the best time to test, you know, what kind of testing is the best. Again, the PCR testing, which we all know is still the gold standard. I know uh, here in the UAE, the, um, the PCR test is done. You, we have the DPI test, uh, which um, detects inflammation in the body and shows that the body is going through some um, inflammatory process. It's not very specific for COVID, but it tells us that's an inflammatory process and that helps you know, an individual to know if, he's, if he needs to go for PCR or if he's getting sick or not. And then we have um, the antibody testing. The antibody testing um, here in the UAE is done uh, through the ELISA machine where an individual can go to the hospital have a blood um, work done, and then that, that tells them that if they have an antibody, it tells them either they have been infected before, um, and it depends on the kind of infection. So two antibodies, uh, we have the IgM, which shows um, current infection, and we have the IgG, which shows that the infection has happened in the past, and perhaps the individual has now developed a longer lasting um, antibody. So when is the best time to um, test? Usually from two days before the onset, onset of symptoms up to 14 days. But we see that, you know, from the 10th, uh, from the 10th day, you know, the, the probability of getting a positive uh, PCR res um, result begins to wane a bit. And again, if the amber line you see there has to do with the viral culture. So after about 10 days, the virus, you know, becomes more and more difficult to culture when we take it from swabs. And this is a very important point um, because it takes us to the next slide, which talks about what we call um, the um, cycle threshold. Now, you would have discovered that currently the advice is if an individual is positive and has been isolated for two weeks, he doesn't need to do a COVID test you know, anymore. The thinking behind this is that after 14 days, individuals are no longer infectious. This has actually been proven with a lot of studies. And the cycle threshold, you know, uh, speaks to that. Now, the cycle threshold, when we do the PCR testing, in very simple terms, what we do is that we try to uh, multiply the virus or make it more to be able to um, 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 read the genetic material. And this is done by heating and cooling process. So one cycle is one heating and one cooling process. Now, the longer um, or the more cycles you need to do to identify the virus means the less effective it is. So in fact, by the time you do the um, heating and cooling process for more than 35 cycles, it's most likely that the virus is no longer infective. So this is done for every test, right? So when you do a COVID test, this is also a result that, that is done. Some authorities say more than 40, some say less than 35, but usually, after 10 days, we see that it takes a lot of, you know, cycles for us to see the virus. A lot of the tests are very, very sensitive. You know, we've seen cases where people come back uh, positive after uh, more than, you know, two months, up to 50 days. We've seen a case of 50 days still positive. And this is because of this um, sensitivity of the test picking up, you know, very, very tiny genetic materials that are not um, inf um, infective at all. Now, also very important to note, is that the symptoms are also what we call dose dependent, all right? So you need to have a high concentration of the virus. You need to be exposed for a longer time to be able to get infected. And that's why we have a definition as close contacts to be within, you know, um, less than 1.5 meters, you know, without protection and more than 15 minutes with an infected individual. So it's very, very important, you know, that uh, for us to note that the virus is dose dependent. Dependent. All right, so why is social distancing so important? Um, this graph tells us um, um, many things, and I'll try and simplify it by saying that if 70% of the population complies to social distancing, it's going to be very difficult for us to um, flatten the curve. I'm sure you are very, very familiar with that term. It was thrown around a lot. But when 80%, which is the green um, um, curve you see, are compliant, we were, were able to reduce the number of um, active cases, you know, quite dramatically over, you know, a three-month period or a four-month period. And then if 90% are compliant, and then that, that, um, that goes down more dramatically. 
Now, a study from the Lancet, which is um, one of the major uh, medical um, publications that we follow, shows that if we do not do any social distancing, there's a 13% risk of infection. If we keep one meter apart, you know, you have a 2.6% risk of infection. But when you're up to two meters apart, you know, it reduce, reduces to 1.3 meters, 3% um, uh, of infection. This is just without just social distancing alone. And so that's why the advice is that we need to keep a distance of not less than 1.5 meters. I would always advise two meters, which is, which is safer, from people who, is, who are not of the same household with you, from people who are not um, living with you. Very, very important. Um, and this is one of the things we have seen that is, has continued to um, make the infection spread. When people leave their houses, when they are meeting up with friends, you know, they are not, some people are not um, obeying that social distancing, they are not keeping um, 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 the rules. So we advise, if you are with people who are not part of your household, it doesn't matter how close or how nice they are to you, please maintain the social distancing. Especially now that schools have resumed, it's not just in, in schools, you know, in, in many public places, we see that the rules have been followed. I mean, I, I've actually gone through the, um, the protocol for the American school in Dubai, which I think is very, very good, complies, you know, um, very well with the, um, the procedures, with what has been released by the Dubai government. However, we see a lot of infections when people are outside these um, secured places, people visiting family members, you know, people socializing outside, you know, these secure places. So it's very important that we keep, you know, our social distancing up. All right, so the next slide is going to show us a few um, high-risk activities. And I think I'll just focus on, on, on the right um, of, the, of the graph, which is the high-risk activity. So you see that, you know, nightclubbing is very, very high risk. Um, and that we've seen that as a, as a major reason for the infections, you know, in many, in many countries. And when universities open, we saw that, you know, as a major reason, because, you know, these are adults who you cannot control as well as, you know, you would in, in the, the, the lower levels of schools. Um, indoor bars, you know, having indoor parties, you know, when you're in a concert or play, even in a sports stadium, especially stadiums that are enclosed and in religious gatherings also like churches, for example, these are high risk areas because of the enclosed nature of the gathering. And so these are places where when we, when we have to go to, we need to be very sure that, you know, the measures that have been advised by the government are followed um, um, to the letter. All right, so we'll talk a bit about, now that we've talked about social distancing, let's talk a bit about um, wearing a mask. Um, and I think the best way to illustrate um, wearing a mask is, is just to give you this simple um, diagram to show how effective we're using a mask um, can be. Number one, the first uh, case, you see somebody who is um, pre-symptomatic, all right, so he's infected, he's not wearing a mask, he still has a 30% probability of infecting people around him. Now, if he's wearing a mask, so the infected person is not wearing a mask, every other person is not wearing a mask, the probability of infection drops to about um, 5%. And that's why, you know, that was the initial advice that was coming from the WHO, where they said that um, once you have symptoms, always wear a mask. That has always been a philosophy as medical professionals. When you come to the hospital, you are sneezing or coughing, we quickly give you a mask to protect people around you. That still works. But even better than that is when everybody wears a mask. Both um, ill people, people who are not ill, we reduce the chances of infection down to 1.5%. Why 1.5%? Because it's not just wearing a mask that is important. It is how you wear the mask and what you do with your mask. I see a lot of people even in indoor places, they put their mask over their, their mouth and then their nose is ex exposed. Remember that what we are dealing with, you know, I talked about aerosols. You know, if somebody is pre-symptomatic, is not even showing symptoms and is infected, he can still spread the virus. And then when he's spreading the virus, right? So he's breathing out, he's not covering his nose, he's going to be releasing those viruses into the, into the, um, um, into the um, environment. Remember the virus are, are in the lungs. So when it breathes out, it's going to release it into the environment. So using the mask is one thing, but using it properly is something else. And I also see a lot of people reusing disposable masks, which, uh, which is the wrong practice. The only mask you should reuse are masks that are washable. And that would bring us nicely to the next point. What are the best and the worst face coverings? I'm sure, you know, 
Yeah, you go around, there are all kinds of masks, you know, very fanciful masks all over the place. So let's let's have a look at, you know, which are the best ones. So the N95 masks are actually quite good. So we'll look at these masks in three levels and uh, where we're going to, um, the efficiency in filtering. Remember I talked about large droplets, which is one way. I talked about the aerosols, which is another way of um, infection. And then in the areas where it can be worn. So the N95 masks are very effective against large droplets, almost 100%, and about 95% at filtering um, the aerosols. Um, um, surgical mask, also very good, 98.5% in filtering out large droplets, and about 89% in filtering out um, the aerosols. So these are usually advised in healthcare settings, but I'm sure a lot of us also wear um, the surgical mask you know, around. Now, you also, there are also the hybrid masks. Now, most of the disposable masks you see are actually hybrid masks, right? That have been developed to help us. If you notice in the packaging when you buy them, it's clearly stated that these are not medical, non medical masks. So these are hybrid masks that they use, you know, the three ply method to use, which is slightly different from the surgical mask. A real surgical mask is it's, it's, it's a bit different, which is used in healthcare settings, which we use in the theaters. So a lot of the hybrid masks that we use is also very good. You know, they help to filter 96%, and then they are efficient at 94% for filtering and aerosols. So this is what we use in public places, in indoors and in crowded places. And then our more common ones now are the two layered cotton masks. So these masks are also very good. You know, when you have the two layers of cotton, and they filter out 99.5% um, of um, Lag droplets and about 82% of aerosols. These are the ones that we need to wash as soon as we get home. What our advice is that when you use the mask, even though it's a reusable mask, wash it every time you finish using it, especially for our children. What I have, what I, I do with my kids, as soon as they get home, they're taking off their masks and they are we're putting it in the in the washing machine, or we hand wash it immediately and we dry it. And they have a pair which they which they change. So that's always a good practice. Do not uh, dry it out in the sun. Make sure it's washed every time you come home. If you are using the reusable mask. All right. What other face coverings are out there? Um, we see, you know, like um, tea towel or dish cloths. Yes, um, it can also be useful. But this is advice, you know, in outdoor areas. Uh, we can have 100% cotton sheds. You know, when you use it, you you, uh, put it, uh, you fold it into two. You can use it as a short-term measure for outdoor areas, but just note that they are not very good uh, when it comes to aerosols. And then natural silk, it's, it's probably one of the ones we shouldn't be using at all. Um, and then scarf and bandanas are quite poor, and they should be used as last resort. So you see anything apart from the first ones I've mentioned, should only be used in outdoor areas. Outdoor areas, because again, it's better to social distance. It's a good ventilation, you know, um, outdoors. So yes, they can be used, you know, for outdoor uh, um, activities. And finally, I see a lot of people using masks with a built-in um, valve or vent. Just remember that a lot of these vents, um, you know, protects you when you breathe in, but they allow you to breathe out your expired air. So people who are infected, it doesn't protect others. Yeah, it, it, it allows um, a larger droplets you know, to be released, you know, into the atmosphere. So if you can, please um, prevent using um, the one-way valves, except, you know, for specialized masks that protects both in and out, but just be sure that um, you use the correct mask. And finally, and um, before going to questions, the facts matter. Continue to use our face um, coverings. Avoid large gatherings. We need to clean our hands regularly, like I've talked before, not less than 20 seconds of thorough washing with our hands. Even when we are using sanitizers, we should rub our hands, you know, for up to 20 seconds with adequate sanitizers. And then let's maintain the two meter distance. And finally, if we have symptoms, please let us isolate while we contact the relevant um, authorities. Paul, I think I'll stop here um, to give time for questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Nosa. So for those who are listening in, if you want to put your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window, we'll start to go through those. So um, a few questions around um, how long the virus can survive on 
on fabric, uh, clothes. Um, should children be changing their clothes when they get home from school? Um, kind of just the thought on cloth, cotton, kind of wearable fabric. Any any yep. recommendations around that? Yep. So um, I I'll just quickly go back to this slide I talked about on. Um, so the recommendation is yes, as soon as children um, come back home, let them take off their clothes and let the clothes be washed, let it be laundered. And um, what we see on um, cardboard and, and organic materials, for example, um, they, they shouldn't last more than a day, you know, so to say, because we see the, the smoother the surface, you know, the, the longer the virus uh, will last. So we'll say for clothes, and um, which, which is more or less like an organic surface, it should be less than a day. However, when children get home, um, like I alluded to before, the laundry should be done immediately. They shouldn't wear their clothes for prolonged periods. You know, they take off their clothes and then, especially their school uniforms, and then it should be laundered. That, that would be the recommendation. And Dr. Nos, I think I heard you say in the other presentation that ironing masks yes. Uh, is yes. a very good idea. Yep. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. And of course, um, we we'll would encourage as much as possible to iron because heat also helps, you know, very high temperatures also helps to inactivate the virus. Yes, which is, which is a very good practice. Thanks, Paul. And if we're going to be washing clothes and masks, high temperature makes sense as well. It does. Well, it, it does, but again, just the, the detergent itself is, is good enough to uh, inactivate and break the envelope of the virus and, it, and inactivate it. So that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, question about um, spraying uh, or fogging, if sometimes called school bags or other items. Uh, is there an effective, is that an effective method? Is there a particular spray that is better than others? Well, I wouldn't say there's a, there's no spray that is better than others. The most important thing is to know exactly um, the content of what you're buying and read the label. We would always advise that anything you're buying should have not less than 70% alcohol, which is very, very good for uh, inactivating the virus. Uh, again, there are very specific um, sprays that uh, talks about what it can kill. Now, be very careful. A lot of, um, a lot of what what I see are antibacterial sprays or antibacterial wipes. These are totally different. We're dealing with a virus, we're not dealing with a bacteria because the viruses are much smaller than the, than, than, than the bacteria. So what you are buying, be sure that it is effective for viruses. So I would not recommend one product over the, over the other, but before you buy a product, read the label and be sure what, it's, what, it's, um, what it has been produced for but generally not less than 70% alcohol for your hand wipes. And then um, going back to the question about the bags, again, it's always better to have a mechanical action. So a wiping down on all of the surface of the bag is always better than just um, a regular spray. So that's, that, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. There's a, a question about uh, steaming a house uh, from time to time to clear the virus from the environment, indoor environment. Have you heard any effective strategies of how to um, keep your home safe besides yeah. wiping down? Yeah. So what I would say, um, yeah, wiping down always because it's always the gold standard. What I would say better than steaming is ventilation. Very, very important. Yeah, better than yeah. steaming, open and ventilate your house, you know, let the air um, um, flow in, let the air flow out. Because again, when you steam, what happens is the virus may be under debris also. So you steam, the virus is under the debris or the or droplets may be under the debris, and then you steam on top of the debris, right? So you're not actually getting to the virus. But when you do that mechanical action, you're cleaning and wiping away, you're getting to the virus. And again, for the aerosol ones, the ones that are suspended in air, the best way to get rid of them is through good ventilation of the environment. That, that, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Um, and getting a little more narrow on this one, uh, yes. hypochlorous acid is being recommended in the UAE. Um, do you have any views on that or any studies that you can point to one way or the other? I would, Perhaps I will need to get back on this with very specific um, studies, but what I, what I can say is hypochlorous acid, you know, again, the, the key thing, the key chemical there is chlorine. 
chlorine is the key ingredient and chlorine is effective when it comes to viruses. So just off my head, I'll say, okay, if it has chlorine, then it, it's good enough. But again, I will still emphasize the use of mechanical action. Okay, very good. Um, well, this is a question probably not for either of us, Dr. Nosa, but just a, a parent concern that um, at his or her workplace, uh, the employer is still encouraging large group meetings in person. Um, are there any organizations in Dubai that can help uh, safely address uh, this issue? Well, from where I stand, I think it's probably an issue for the authorities because I guess they are the, um, they are the final say on um, you know, gatherings and those who probably do not um, stick to the recommendations. So I, I think I'll, I'll leave this for the authorities to deal with. Sure, okay. Do you know of any anonymous uh, lines that people can call? No, I don't. But I would imagine that you know the usual emergency lines should also help out. You know, in in, in, in things like this. Yes. Okay. Um, question about swimming. Uh, now, swimming pools have chlorine, but I know it's yep. a very low low concentration. Is swimming uh, any better, worse, or about the same as any other activity? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question, um, Richard. We've not. Um, I just want to clarify. Number one, that the coronavirus is not waterborne. All right. It's um, it's an airborne. It's 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 a droplet and an air, um, aerosol infection. More. So the most important thing about swimming is not the swimming activity itself. It's actually the activities around the swimming pool. All right, the social distancing around the swimming pool, keeping close to your friends, you know, and that also needs to be put in place, you know, cleaning the surfaces, because again, the, the water is chlorinated, so we, do, we expect the water itself to be safe, but the activity around the swimming pool is what's important. That makes sense. Good, thank you. Uh, the last question we have at this point is just around uh, reusable masks, multi-layer reusable masks, but those were filters. And I heard you say earlier that filters are, are perfectly fine for the person who's using them, but not fine yes. for the rest of the world uh, because the air is going out. Uh, it's protecting Absolutely. the air going in. So um, that's why schools are, are not allowing filter uh, masks with filters. Yes, that makes a lot of sense, Paul. Okay. Parents, do we have any other questions out there? Give you a moment to populate the Q&A. Okay. I'll take the opportunity while we're seeing if there are any last questions, just to just to address the parents. I know the focus here was on um, information and facts about uh, COVID-19. This, you know, we're in our fifth week of school. Um, we are our health and safety protocols. We believe are holding up well. There are some soft spots that we need to uh, take a closer look at. We're having a meeting today, just looking at what we see in the hallways as far as social distancing, particularly among older students. Uh, lunches. Um, we're doing very well in many areas, but there are some areas we need to make some adjustments to. Um, you know, we're not, um, we want to be as transparent as we can with positive cases, and we fully expect and, and are managing a few positive cases uh, with over 1,800 students coming to campus at any given time throughout the week, no more than about 1,500 at a time. We expect to always be managing some positive cases and always managing um, and supporting students who get uh, quarantined. We're working very closely with the Dubai Health Authority on um, just making sure that we're on the same page with how they're viewing uh, tracing and how they're viewing keeping schools safe. We have added some additional layers. Um, of extra protection just because we feel it's common sense and what we're hearing uh, from experts. So we are looking at every facet of the operation to help people keep students safe. And But what Dr. Nosa spoke to today uh, is what we're preaching here in school, distancing, um, wearing your mask, um, and good hygiene. 
on our end, uh, isolating, uh, and this is where we can use your help as well. Isolating at the moment there are symptoms, isolating um, specifically if you get a test or if you've been traced, um, that makes a huge, huge difference and allows us to prevent, uh, prevent any sort of clusters of positive cases. Uh, and thankfully, knock on wood, um, all of those who have uh, experienced a positive test for COVID are, uh, are doing well, relatively well. So we're not gonna let our guard down. Uh, every day we're back in school, we feel is a victory, but we don't take it for granted by any means. Um, it's the primary thing we're doing is just to make sure we can stay open, but do so in a safe way. So we've got a couple last questions here. Um, and uh, let's see, so, okay. So the question about mask, it wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, valve question of mask, but masks that have filters, uh, I don't fully understand the difference, but Dr. Nosa, do you know what this, so the question is how safe are multi-layer reusable masks with filters, a filter insert, not a valve? Yeah, so that's fine. Uh, that, that's a good question. So the most important thing is that if you are using multi-layer re reusable mask, you need to be sure that, you know, the air going in and out of the mask is, is, is filtered. So it's not a one-way valve. So if okay. the air going in and out of the mask is filtered, then, then it's safe. You just need to be sure exactly the, the mechanism of the mask. And for the fact, okay. and for the fact that it's multi-layered, of course, it gives you quite, quite good protection. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, question about uh, ultraviolet light um, or any light that's generated. Has that been shown to help the spread of, uh, prevent the spread of the virus? You know, we, we got a lot of questions with ultraviolet light. You know, ultraviolet light plays um, a role in um, certain settings, you know, in hospital settings, you know, there are some kinds of sterilization that is done by ultraviolet light. It may have a role, but what we are seeing and what we still encourage is the mechanical action of actually um, cleaning um, 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 surfaces and cleaning the doorknobs, of the environment. Yes. So st studies are still out there. There's no clear conclu conclusion. Yes, we know it has some st um, sterilizing um, properties, but for COVID-19, we see advice that um, mechanical action is always the best to actually clean surfaces. Okay. Um, a question about uh, ventilating a room when you don't have uh, access to uh, outside window or even good airflow through an air conditioner. Um, do, are there any uh, standalone filters, air filters that uh, you'd recommend or that, that work? That's the way, I mean, um, to ventilate the room, we, you need to have um, um, a ventilator. So I'm, I'm not aware of standalone ventilators. What I'm aware of is probably standalone fans that also recirculate the air that is already in the room. Um, so for a room without windows, I guess the next best thing would be to open the doors. And I hope the doors probably would lead to some sort of um, external environment, not leading into another room. So there's no easy way to answer that question. <laughs> to ventilate um, an environment, you need to have a ventilator. Okay. Um, question, Dr. Nosa, about uh, antibody testing. Uh, is there any further clarification from the research whether that provides any uh, lasting protection for those who have uh, developed antibodies through a positive experience? I mean, that's a fantastic question. And that, that, that question also, you know, also segues very nicely into the, in, into the vaccinations also. And I'm sure maybe this morning um, in the news, I saw that the UAE is very, very optimistic that you know, the vaccinations will be made readily available sooner than we, than we think. So the thing about antibodies is, um, and I, I guess the most important point here is that it's still an early disease. Just remember that we're still less than one year into um, COVID-19. So we're talking about antibodies that can be developed over years and years. So it's still very early. But the initial studies are looking promising. We're seeing um, people having antibodies and we're seeing you know, people having the kind of antibodies that we hope they should have because there are two kinds. Just think about it in your, in your blood. The simplest way to put it in your blood, you have liquid and then you have um, um, cells or particles and antibodies are produced by both the liquid and the particles and the cell. What we always prefer is it becomes what we call a cell-mediated um, antibodies. That's the much lo longer lasting ones. 
and now we are seeing some of those cells stimulated to produce antibodies. So the simple answer is still too early to tell how long the antibodies will last, but we have seen very promising results at this time. Excellent. Okay, so last last question, and then we'll allow the Q and A to be populated. Some of these questions, I think, are better answered offline. But the questions around, you know, I think we all have um, uh, we've all become exposed to all these cleaning products. Uh, so we're constantly using uh, disinfectant wipes, we're sprays, we're um, particularly around children. Do you have some recommendations as to just coming in contact with a lot of disinfectant? Is it best to really shield children from that once it's clean? Is it best to clean something and then follow it up with soap and water? What, is there any anything we should be worried about when it comes to the disinfectant itself? Um, thanks, Paul. My first choice would always be wash your hands. That's, that will always be my first choice, you know, for children. Wash your, or anybody wash your hands as um, frequently as you can. Even when you use disinfectants, what we tell people is, even when you use this, this effect, and the next opportunity you get is to wash your hands, right? So again, for every disinfect, and this is something we need to um, do better, is for every product you buy, you need to read exactly what it contains. You need to read how safe it is. It's very important. A lot of people do not realize that there are certain products that they may be allergic to, you know, and it's something for them to read and um, understand what is contained. A lot of the products are safe. Of course, a lot of the products are safe, but I cannot speak for every single product. Um, it behoves on us to be sure exactly what is contained. Um, alcohol itself is safe, you know, because I know the majority of the um, of the product will contain alcohol. For very few people, you know, it may cause dryness and cracking of the hands, and so we advise, you know, use moisturizers, you know, when you finish um, using the alcohol. If you are one of such persons. But generally, I think the key message would be, please, whatever products you are going to buy, especially for your kids, just read the label and be sure they are safe for them to use. Okay, thank you. That makes total sense. And we'll, we'll do some homework on um, which brands uh, are recommended. Yep. And of course, there are lists out there of which brands are, are banned, which we might still see out there on the shelves. Um, so it's really what's, what's in the spray besides the alcohol that we should really be paying attention yes. to. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Well, fantastic, Dr. Nosa. Um, this has, as always, been very informative, and I know our parents, um, I can speak on behalf of them, have appreciated this time. And uh, we have a couple more questions for you down the road, but we'll have those offline. So really, really appreciate you taking the time today, and we uh, thank you for all the great work you're doing in Dubai. Thanks, Paul. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. All right. Thanks, everybody.